Lisa A. Smith, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Howard. Yeah, let's 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 dive in. So first, uh, it, can you introduce yourself? Tell folks uh, who, who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So I'm Lisa A. Smith. I am a serial entrepreneur. I started my first company in 2015, my second in 2017. Um, I started Professionally Fit in 2015 and the Black Health Academy in 2017, all working in the realm of health and plant-based nutrition organizational wellness. I'm also the executive director of an organization called the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group, uh, where we focus on utilizing a whole food plant-based no oil diet to prevent and reverse chronic disease. I'm the author of the Plant-Based Foodie and the creator of a course, <clears throat> excuse me, called Farm to Table, um, which is a course I created about almost four years ago now, which helps individuals make the transition to a whole food plant-based lifestyle. I'm certified in plant-based nutrition myself, a professional speaker, and I absolutely love this work. So thank you for having me. Awesome. I, I just, I have to admit, I did not realize that PBSG had an executive director. I thought it was just Paul working 36 hours a day. <laughs> no, Paul asked me to come on as an executive director. We're going on a year now, Howard. Um, I think it's been since August of 2019. So wow. I'm now running the day to day. I work very closely with Paul. Um, so he's cut that down to about 34 hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's awesome. Is it such a great organization? <laughs> Excuse me. It's such a it's such a an attainable model for every community. Agreed. Agreed. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that and what your what your vision is. And uh, but let's. Um, so um, I was reading the the um, plant based foodie. And it, I, I saw that you, uh, you weren't always fit and healthy. So you, like you were like 190 pounds in 2012. So how did, how did you, like, what was your life like at, before? And then how did you get introduced to health? Yeah, absolutely. So in January of 2012, I hired my first personal trainer. I was working as a social worker for the state of Michigan in foster care. And I was just unhappy with the body I was in. My body, uh, in my opinion, was just not aesthetically pleasing. And also, you know, of course, the threat of chronic disease looming. So I didn't have any pre-existing conditions, but I really wanted to get my body to a place where I was confident in it. I was sick of covering up all of my insecurities. So I decided to hire a personal trainer who happened to work with me at the state of Michigan. Her name was Tiffany. And um, she helped me on my journey to begin to lose weight. Well, Tiffany was strictly a personal trainer. We didn't focus on nutrition. And so what happened in the fall of that year, I actually got the opportunity, uh, federal uh, internship, and I moved abroad to Italy. So here I am now on my own living in Rome, and I had to continue what I had learned from Tiffany from an exercise standpoint, but the nutrition was all DIY. And living in a different country, I noticed the vast difference in the way they consume food, food in Rome. You know, things were fresh, refrigerators were smaller, they were walking to get bread every day, things were made from scratch, it was more communal, a many, many differences. And so I started keying in a little differently on my new nutrition. I certainly wasn't a plant-based vegan yet. Um, and then I got back from Italy in 2013 and I realized that I love living abroad and I wanted to do it again. So I left a few months later, later and that's when I moved to Foshan, China. So here I am living in the south of China and um, again, vast difference in the way food is consumed. And there I noticed, you know, meat was used as more of a flavorant as opposed to a star of the show. And the little mm -hmm. meat that was on the table, again, because it was so much communal eating, it was shared among many people. And the base of our foods were more uh, vegetables and grains. Um, and so I got back to the U.S. after living back to back on these two different continents and realized we were doing something wrong here in the U.S. Um, so I completely shift careers. I went from social work over to health, became a certified personal trainer, started deep diving into the science of nutrition, uh, started kind of testing some of these theories out on myself. And I realized that a whole food plant-based diet was the most optimal uh, on the planet for longevity and chronic disease prevention. So I became a plant-based vegan about six years ago now. Um, and I started creating programming and companies surrounded around helping individuals adopt that same lifestyle. Wow, that's, cool. that's, that's an amazing journey to be able to, you know, to be jettisoned so far away out of your orbit, to be able to look back and see, it's like, you know, when the astronauts first saw like, oh, look, Earth is this beautiful, well, like we, we, we can have perspective. And you were able to, to look and see like, there's, there are other ways to deal with food than you, than you had been and that you had learned. Yes, 
A hundred percent. That's exactly what happened. Um, I know my journey is unique um, and that most people, you know, are home based when they discover this and they have to navigate all of the things they've learned and the um, habits they've adopted over the years. And I had the pleasure of being immersed into a different culture where eating differently was more forced on me. Right. And I was able to bring that back um, and institute it and help others do the same. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm, I'm imagining that being a social worker in the foster care system might have been a stressful thing occasionally. <laughs> might have been, maybe just a little. <laughs> uh, um, so I know you're also a, uh, an expert on behavior change. Was like, when you look back on those times, were you using food for things other than nutrition, like to sort of manage state and emotion? Yeah, it's almost safe to say I was using food for everything but nutrition. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, you know, working in the foster care system, I was working in Oakland County in Michigan, was, which is arguably one of the most difficult counties to work in with regard to uh, foster care. And I would have to go to court on a regular basis, you know, to campaign for these children. Um, and in the effort to reunite them with their biological families. And so you can imagine that came with a host of stressors and anxiety. And I, at one point, Howard thought I would actually be on medications for anxiety because of how stressful it was. Because I had some cases where the biological families were so combative, right? They blamed me and the state for taking their kids and not the circumstances. And so they would literally be, you know, spouting vitriol in the courtroom. And I would have, you know, high amounts of uh, anxiety because of it. And so, you know, quelling things with food and letting food be a comfort and letting food be that one thing that I can control and that makes me happy for that short period of time was really my story. Um, and it wasn't until I completely eliminated refined sugar from my diet that I realized there is a such thing as food for a better mood and we really can use food. It's not just physical medicine, but mental and emotional as well. Um, and it's been an absolute game changer. Mm. So I'm, I'm curious because they are work, working in that part of the social system, mm -hmm. you kind of, I, you know, you see the, the worst effects of the breakdowns in our society, right? Like these, like, you know, everyone's talking about it, but at some point there's a rock bottom where all of the forces, and yet you went, you then shifted to like health and wellness and nutrition and fitness. How do you, how do you square that circle, sort of like like people are living, you know, in poverty under the effects of systemic racism, under the effects of systemic classism, under the effects of, of neglect by by state, by by authorities, by infrastructure, and then you say, well, the way to solve this is, or, or a way to solve this, or an important thing to address is health. Yeah. How how did that come about for you? you know, reading and studying. So although I'm certified in plant-based nutrition, you know, getting certification is just not enough. And I study nearly every day my craft. And when I started seeing the da data actually showing how food literally impacts the emotional stability, the problem-solving skills, your moods, your compassion, even your levels of aggression, um, that's when I realized, you know, when I, the way I want to impact the community um, with my programming is teaching individuals that, hey, it's not, it, yes, we want to avoid heart disease and we want to avoid hypertension and high cholesterol, but if we can literally um, teach health and teach a better way of eating in these more impoverished communities, more vulnerable communities, it can really change their outcomes. It can change even their ability to perform and it can change the outcome. So, Sorry okay. One of the one of the great books that I read on this was um, Fast Food Genocide um, by Dr. Joel Furman. I thought was an excellent did an excellent job of articulating the science and the data showing how food literally impacts behavior. Mm. Um, and when we are dealing with populations who live in food deserts, um, and when we're combating things like access, it's really important to address how literally changing what's on their plate can address. Um, impact their outcomes in their daily lives. Everything from intelligence um, to accessibility to problem solving, it really should be a modality that's instituted in what we call um, the programming to reunite families or to help families get out of whatever situations they're in. We like to address housing, we like to address finances, we like to address education, but we really also should be addressing health and nutrition as well, which will make a huge impact on all of those other things. 
Mm. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing as, as a social worker, you probably studied very public health approaches mm -hmm. to, to the issues. And there's a way in which like telling people like you can improve your plate, you can make better food choices, in some ways goes against some, some of the tenets that I learned. You know, I, I, did, I studied public health and I'm seeing it more. I'm going to ask this question from a very sort of ignorant, innocent place, right? So like last year I read uh, Ibram Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Mm -hmm. And he's arguing that, any, that anything that sort of puts the onus on the, the disadvantaged group is unfair. Mm -hmm. And so at the same, the same time as we're like, let's look at housing, let's look at food access, let's look at food deserts. There's an element of sort of the social justice movement that says that it's, um, that telling people to eat better is almost blaming them as opposed to the system. Did, does that make any sense, like the, the, my confusion? No, it does make sense, but I think it all boils down to the framing of the information. See, sometimes one of the mistakes, in my opinion, that organizations and entities make when trying to help these impoverished communities is thinking that we could just give them the access or give them the resources more for, as, as a handout. And mm. what really needs to happen is more inclusion right? They need to be included in a conversation, included in the treatment plan, included in the problem solving, and that it shouldn't just be a bunch of individuals who doesn't look like that community sitting down and making decisions for them. So we, I believe the onus is on both sides, right? There is a plethora of systemic oppression and racism and injustices going dating back centuries. Absolutely no doubt about it. But at the end of the, of the day too, though, does an individual make a decision on what to eat on their own. Yes, but then the argument can be made that, well, they didn't know anything else, right? Um, and so then it's our responsibilities to create platforms where they can be educated. So that's the reason I created the Black Health Academy in 2017. Now with me educating you on what nutrition looks like, now with me educating you on how to read food labels, uh, what these sugars and the, and the meat does to your body and your brain, right? And, and you making the decision then after having the knowledge and being provided the knowledge, I mean, being included in a conversation, you then making the decision to continue to consume these things brings up a different part of the conversation. Um, so I agree that we certainly shouldn't um, completely put the onus on them, but we do make individual um, uh, choices in our own lives and in our households. And so both sides need to be brought to the table and, and be made to understand one another. Mm, that is so, so helpful. That really <laughs> clarifies a couple of things for me. Um, so you, you, the first thing you would describe yourself as is an entrepreneur, yeah. a serial entrepreneur. And as, from my understanding of entrepreneurs is that you, you look for gaps and you fill them. Yeah. And so what was the gap that the Black Health Academy filled? Like there's like black people don't have different health needs, right? So what was... Uh, what, what was missing that you felt you needed, you could step in and, and contribute? 100% representation, 100%. So it's a simple question. So what, when I started mastering plant-based nutrition, Howard, I can say definitively that 99% of the books I read, the lectures I went to, right, uh, the talks I attended, the YouTube videos I watched, were by Caucasian people. Um, and, and I'm not even gonna say non-people of color, it was Caucasian people, right? Um, there was no diversity. Um, and mostly, and I would say out of that, that 99%, most of them were men, right? Only a handful of women, um, but there was no representation. So what I began to see and notice um, is that when anytime we want a group of people to adopt something or consider it as a this modality as a treatment plan there has to be some type of connection right and they have to see themselves doing it and the way most people are able to see themselves doing something is by seeing other people that look like them doing it mm -hmm. and so i started the black health academy simply because there was a huge gap like in in the vegan and plant-based world that still looked at as mostly an elitist diet i remember i was speaking at university of michigan last year they had me come in and specifically talk about the intersectionality of race and veganism um, for this exact reason. Um, and the audience was made up of mostly, you know, students who were not people of color. And I said, why did you guys go plant-based? Why did you come become vegan? And most of them was for the environment um, and was for 
you know, the earth. And for us, what I was telling them is that most people of color, we choose this diet specifically for health reasons, right? Um, the earth and the compassion and the animals comes later. We're just trying to lower our blood pressure, get rid of obesity, get rid of cancer, get rid of the type two diabetes. And what happens is when we see ads, when we see doctors, when we see restaurants popping up, Number one, we don't see ourselves in these commercials um, and these in these books on these recipe books. We don't see ourselves in the conferences. I'm speaking at the plant based prevention of disease conference just this year. And I think I may be the only black woman on the lineup. And because of that, I actually received an email from someone out of New York who said, oh, my God, I'm attending Peapod this year, the Peapod conference for the first time. And she's a she's a black woman. And she said, I was so happy to see somebody that looks like me so much so that I sought you out and emailed you and I want to know every Everything about you and I want to know how you got on the lineup and how can I follow in your footsteps that's what's missing when I attended Peapod just as an attendee last year in North Carolina it was the same thing I felt isolated and I didn't feel necessarily there were other people of color on the lineup all men but I didn't feel included right and so that lack of inclusion makes an entire group of people feel like this thing, i.e. a plant-based diet, is not available to them. And I needed my people to know that it was available to them and that there was somebody who was on the front lines rooting for them, who had mastered the information at, at a high level as anybody else had, and that this was accessible. They think it's too expensive. They think there's, you know, they, they, they're intimidated by the foods. Um, and they're intimidated by how to cook. Even many of the recipe books just don't have recipes that appeal to us. And so I felt, I felt like it was really Really necessary to create a platform um, curated for us by us um, and that people of color had representation and I can tell you Howard my signature course farm to table I've gotten so many students it's made up of mostly people of color uh, mostly black women to be honest with you and we've had hundreds of students come through my course and um, they I've had emails from students that say I literally was seeking out a course that was specifically addressing people of color, a plant-based course, and I'm so happy I found it. And so that's the gap we're filling. Say more about the recipes. What, because uh, <laughs> I, I have no idea. Like, oh, we, so our foundation in eating a lot of time people of color is, uh, unfortunately this, this diet was forced on us, but it is what it is, is, is a lot of soul food, right? Um, and there's a lot of hearty things that we're brought up on. And there's things we're not brought up on like quinoa, right? And while we introduce those things uh, to, to uh, our students at the Black Health Academy and Farm and Table, when somebody is making a transition to a plant-based diet, um, familiarity is key, right? And so having recipes where they feel like, I know what this is, I feel comfortable with it. This is essentially what I normally eat just with the meat removed, um, even down to the seasonings, which is a huge, huge point. Um, a lot of organizations that I've been a part of and recipe books I've bought, even the seasoning combination just doesn't stick the taste buds like we're used to um, in, 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 the, in the black community. And so it's really important that we're able to see some of those soul recipes um, and some of those things that we're used to, barbecue recipes that we're used to and able to replicate that in the plant-based world and make people feel more comfortable with um, making the transition. And so it makes a huge difference, quite honestly. So is there is there a difference between like the black soul food that you'd find you know, sort of a good transition food and basically Southern cooking? Um, I don't, there's always a difference. Um, the transition food, when you say the soul food transition food, you're talking specifically about the vegan food? Well, just, just the flavor profiles. Oh, no, flavor, that's the thing. So the flavor profile can remain the same without the animal products, without the dairy, right? And that's all in the seasoning uh -huh. and using those smoked flavors um, and understanding uh -huh. how to blend those things so that it excites the, our taste buds in a certain uh -huh. way. And I'm speaking from this from experience. I've been to uh, culinary events, plant-based culinary events, um, where all of the chefs that were preparing the food were Caucasian and the food was bland to me and it was bland to a lot and and i've and i've experienced this at veg fest i've experienced this at culinary events it just is what it is and i know when tasting the food that the community i serve it just won't be palatable for us a lot of times it, it, i go with friends and stuff to veg fest and people who aren't vegan yet and i'm like come try this come try this and they're like 
I can't eat this every day. Like where's the flavor, literally the flavor, right? Uh -huh. And so it's been an issue. And so being able to uh, teach our people how to make the transition with uh, those flavors that they can still enjoy without the added, you know, detriment of chronic disease is one of the perks. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So are there any cookbooks or, uh, you know, cooks or recipes that you, you know, off the top of your head would say, like, these are a good contribution to uh, to Black vegan culture? Yeah. So I love um, Janae Claiborne's uh, Sweet Potato Soul. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think she's awesome. Um, and so what's hard for me, what's very difficult for me, is that I teach a difference between plant-based and vegan, just vegan versus plant-based. And so there are actually several uh, vegan soul food cookbooks by people of color, but I wouldn't recommend or endorse them simply because they're loaded with so much oil mm -hmm. um, and so much processed vegan food, right? And so if the recipes call for go out and buy, you know, a fake cheese, go out and get some fake chorizo, I don't endorse it because I teach this diet for health. So I need the meals. And that's what I like about sweet potato. So uh, that's what I use in my recipe book. I need the meals to be made only from whole real food and not a bunch of vegan processed foods. So that probably will be the only one I would endorse um, because the others are just loaded with stuff that still wreaks havoc on the body and brain. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, and you wrote in the plant-based foodie something that like took my breath away for a second. And I'm like, Ooh, you like, where you write, like you can, don't, don't worry about labels. Don't worry about being vegan. You can call yourself vegan and have salmon like once a month. And, and I'm like, Oh my God, the vegans would like, okay. pillar I, you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the barrier we need to break down. Um, there I'm not saying that you should, I don't, right? But what I'm saying is when we assign our selves these titles and these labels, and then if we have a slip up or something, or we're still in the transition and we don't adhere to this, how this label is defined by society, um, then we are ostracized because of it. We're criticized because of it. We feel we have to now be closet eaters. So I'm not in endorsing anyone going to eat meat and calling themselves vegan. And you're right, it would, it would anger so many people and I don't care. Um, because my point is you can, you can label yourself or you don't have to, I'm strictly plant-based. Um, and there was a time where, you know, I was making the transition. I was pescatarian at some point um, before I went completely plant-based. And I was still have, I know people who's like, look, I still have an egg every now and then, right? Um, I'm like, go for it. It's, it's your choice, right? It's totally your choice. And there is evidence and science now emerging, showing all oh, what, what, what they may call like a small flexitarian diet, where there's some small bits of animal products it's still present in your diet and you still can enjoy the full health benefits of being plant-based. Um, and so, and that comes out of, you know, a lot of the Mediterranean cultures. And so the, how you label yourself is up to you. If you're still making that transition and there's still a few things that are still present in your diet and you still want to call yourself vegan, I'm not upset about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause so, I mean, as you said, so much of vegan culture is white upper class culture. Right? Yes. hundred percent. Yes. Um, and you know, I've, I've become sensitized to these, like for me, like, oh, the plant-based vegan movement, like we're fine. Like we're this oasis of sanity in a crazy world. And it's, it, I began that, you know, I began to see that that wasn't the case. Thanks to, um, you know, my friend Milton Mills, whom I think you, you know, I think he was one of the, the other Peapod presenters yeah. of color uh, yeah. last year. And also, you know, we have a, a here in uh, Durham, North Carolina area, we have a veg fest that um, has in the last year and a half uh, really reached for diversity. Um, and we've had, you know, sort of racism panels and, um, you know, so I think, you know, I think my, my role here is to is to help my fellow Caucasian and Caucasian males see that there are um, there are more sides to the story, right? Because like you know the, the first wave was all these like you know old white doctors and you know God bless them, right? They're beautiful souls and they've done great work, uh, and yet we tend to think of like they're the real ones, the authorities. Um, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> what would you say to us? <laughs> Well, number one, 
absolutely make sure your activism includes being active, like actively seeking out individuals um, who are from a different background, from a different education setting, from a different opinion and a different experience um, who, and give them a voice. Give them a voice on your platforms, just like you're doing Howard. Uh, give them a voice at your veg fest. Give them a voice in your company. You know, I even myself, if I'm being completely honest, was taken aback when Paul Challen asked me to be the executive director of the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group because PBNSG um, is made up over 80% of white people who are about 50 and up, Howard. And here I am, 20 years their junior, easily, many of them. And um, many of them, you know, I now have the responsibility of directing their day-to-day, -day, right? Our staff, our volunteers, and I cannot even pretend that it's been easy being a woman of color leading an organization where there is zero other people of color on the executive staff, on the board, um, even from volunteers, there's one other Black woman that I can identify by name who's active. Um, but other than that, I can't even, you can't even imagine what it's been like. And so for Paul to say, Lisa, I saw the brilliance in you. I think um, you have a passion around this content. You have the education. You've been running companies for years. Um, and I want you to step up. That I was even taken aback by that. It's nothing I applied for. I didn't even know he was looking for anyone. But, you know, follow in Paul's footsteps in that, you know, give people of diverse backgrounds an opportunity um, in your organizations, on your platforms, give them, a give them a voice, but don't give them handouts. It's not that we want to be handed a position. We should be qualified for it. Um, the issue is that we don't want you to hire us because we're Black. We want you to not not hire us because we're Black, right? right. And so <laughs> there's a big, big difference in that, big difference. Right, because you want qualified individuals, right? Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, I've I've literally felt a lot of times from our community, even at PBNSG, unfortunately, that you know my voice and my education wasn't respected because I didn't look a certain way. Um, and people will yield their questions to you know a, a white doctor who sits on our board. And so, I, and but when I get on my platform, I'm the authority and I'm spouting the same information, um, but it just looks and feels very different. And so the and I've had, and I actually recently wrote an open letter to our entire community, over 7,000 people at PBNSG. And I had one woman, I, and the title of my letter was Being Black, a Black Woman in America. And I had one woman reply and say, I was so happy to see you become the executive director of PBNSG uh, because I want to interact with Black people more. And I was thinking to myself, that was something that you could have done on your own, right? It's just that's privilege in and of itself waiting for an entity that you're already part of to appoint someone as black so that maybe you can have a few conversations with a black person, right? And so that was shocking to me. It's like, hey, and now I can say, I know, or I engage with, because I want to know what you people are like. And so it's just little microaggressions like that, that chip away at us. And then we can bridge that gap a little better um, when we intentionally seek out authorities in these fields. They exist. People exist. I have colleagues, right? Um, but we don't know about them. And like you said, if we haven't went to, you know, got, gotten all the degrees or been plastered on the um, big stages or at the Veg Fest, have a host of books behind us, a lot of times our information um, isn't respected and that needs to change. Right. And so, you know, one, one example that I'm discovering is I don't, I don't know, like 1% of my white plant-based friends know who Dr. Sebi is. Mm -hmm. And every black vegan ever know is, Dr. right. <laughs> and, and, and you read, you go to Wikipedia and you look at Dr. Sebi and you see he's a quack, he's a fake, he's a fraud. And yet he's, you know, so he was not educated in the Western system. He, he right. He was, it's a sort of a folk tradition. And uh, he, you know, was he's he comes from a different place, and um, yet he's saying the same thing. Like ninety nine percent, the same thing as Esselstyn, as Furman, as Campbell, as Barnard. 
absolutely. And he was, and it's it's crazy because you know he was he's from Honduras, right? He was educated um, on the land, from the land. He's he's direct to the source. It's interesting that a lot of the um, plant based doctors and authorities on plant based nutrition didn't even learn what they know in medical school. They had to seek out subgroups, right? Um, because that was it's not taught in medical school. That's well known to this day that nutrition science is not focused heavily on in, in medical school, and so they too had to get additional education and experience um, on integrative medicine and all of these other uh, holistic practices outside of. They, re they reference their colleagues' books, right? They lean on people like uh, uh, Gregor or T. Colin Campbell and their books and their studies. They don't say what I learned in medical school, right? But as soon as you have someone who's now an authority on these things, who was raised from the land, from the plants, and you're right, Sebi is like, are, we're striving for a mucus-free diet and um, here's how you should eat plant-based and here are the hybrid foods and all of these things and he, he beat a huge case in the state of New York where he was charged with practicing you know medicine without a license that he was able to be it was monumental um, but of course like you said uh, fortunately in this country we respect letters after someone's name as opposed to really dig digging deep into their experience and prior to Western medicine even existed there were medicine men and women in our community right who were more respected because they lived and studied the land and now those people are being labeled as quacks it's really backwards right. uh, can you say a little bit more about dr sebi because i don't i don't know that much about him and i'm guessing my my audience doesn't either yeah i mean dr sebi was uh is a huge holistic pro practitioner he's since passed um but he has a huge following his family still continues his legacy today as far as selling his products he's a huge proponent of a plant-based vegan diet that's free of a uh, mucus causing foods every and that includes starch and that includes animal products um and hybrid foods he there's a, actually a food list that you can find easily on the internet called like dr sabi's approved food list um and he his thought or ideology is that every single disease um comes from mucus in the body and when you completely eliminate mucus from the body and the brain you completely eliminate disease that's even things that have been uh, historically toted as non-reversible or curable like aids HIV. And so there was a huge many, uh, I can't even remember, I think maybe in the 70s or 80s, uh, in the state of New York, he was charged with practicing medicine without a degree. And he was able to literally bring in um, tens of patients who have been cured. I'm talking blindness, you know, arthritis, chronic diseases, things that have been labeled as not curable um, and cured through his methodologies and his teachings. And the, they actually had to bring in evidence from their own physicians that A, they were diagnosed with this thing. And now mm -hmm. after new testing, they no longer have this thing. Um, and that's how he was able to literally beat the state of New York um, and proving that he's not practicing, you know, bunk medicine, that he's actually curing people with herbs from the land. One of his biggest um, products, he really put, um, he really put, put, uh, the, the, uh, what, excuse me, what is it called? The, um, uh, sea moss, sea moss on the map. That's what I was thinking of him. Irish sea moss. So he really put sea moss on the map and, uh, it's one of the most powerful uh, things you can take in your dietary regimen with regard to having 92 out of the 102 vitamins and minerals that we need to thrive. And so sea moss, uh, his family still sells it. He, there's a entire line of products um, where you can reach out to his family, his, his uh, children, and even his wife and get uh, actually a concoction made for you depending on your pre-existing condition. So Dr. Sebi is really powerful, uh, uses all the different plants and herbs from the earth to help eliminate your body from uh, of all that mucus. And of course, you combine pair that with a plant-based diet. Right. And so when I, when I see his work and I hear about him, like par part of me gets nervous that like in the plant-based community, we are, we are striving to be like scientists, right? To say like, we're, we're not the same as, you know, crystal healers and tarot artists. Like we, we really want scientific credibility. And, and yet when you look at the pioneers, all of them, <laughs> right? Campbell was basically, you know, sidelined at Cornell uh, Esselstyn was sidelined at the Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. Um, modern, you know, pe modern cardiologists are being sidelined because they're not bringing in enough money. Uh, 
like you know it's, it's almost like like we're the immigrants and we've arrived and now we want we want to keep out all the other immigrants because <laughs> right because there's a lot about dr sebi that is not scientific in the way that we think about it um and and i think it makes pe it makes some people very nervous mm -hmm. to start you know lumping ourselves in with folk healers Yes, it, it does make people very ner nervous. I agree a thousand percent. But he also literally has thousands of uh, people who, with evidence who have, you know, used his um, his products, who have followed his teachings, um, who have adopted his diet, um, and they have proven to be extremely beneficial and true. And I personally believe we should blend ourselves with the crystal um, healers and the essential oil and the meditators. And, the, you know, we all can say that health is more than just physical. And we can say, you know, mind, body, spirit, and it all works together. Community, it all works together. We know that the number one indicator of long life and longevity is actually not your physical health or what you eat or your diet or your genes, it's social connections, right? And so we can say all this verbally, but then when it comes time to commune and bring all these modalities together to work as a treatment plan to heal ourselves optimally, that's when the breakdown happens. And I believe we should embrace more people who practice these and learn from them um, because the, the evidence speaks for, for itself. Unfortunately, because, and it's almost like what came first, the chicken or the egg, but unfortunately, because a lot of uh, these modalities are looked at as quack or bunk science, um, the, the, no one would even think to give it the funding to get the scientific proof, right? Like, because um, most of these practices are practiced a lot of times by uh, people of color or people who come from more indig indigenous cultures where, you know, these things that are looked at as magic or whatever are used to heal the community, right? But mm -hmm. they won't be respected and they won't be given the platform or the funding to establish it as a more respected modality. And so we have to do it kind of on the side. In, in Farm to Table, you know, we talk about visualization. We talk about meditation. We talk about chakras. All of that is important. It's impossible to just eat a plant and achieve optimal health. It just doesn't work that way. Right. And um, in my experience, the, the Black community is more open to things outside the mainstream, yes. par partly because the mainstream has been so cruel and violent. You know, like I, I remember my first week in graduate school in public health, there were, we were having, it was, was in 1993, we were having a kind of, you know, it was a, like the, the height of the AIDS crisis. And I was at Temple University. It's a, a, a you know, inner city school. And it's like 60% of my classmates were black and we're having this discussion. And, and a bunch of them are saying that they thought that AIDS was like a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, my jaw dropped. Like, I don't understand. Like, how could an intelligent person think that? Then the next week, we were, we were assigned the book, um, I think it was called Bad Blood, about the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. And I'm like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> right? Like, there's, there's, both, there's both more of a distrust yes. uh, and more of a trust of things that are outside of our mainstream. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head with that one, Howard. Quite honestly, iatrophobia. Um, fear of the white coat is a real thing. Um, and what one of the things we teach at the Black Health Academy um, is Black health history. And so things like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, um, people like Henrietta Lacks, people like uh, Marion Sims, John Marion Sims, who's deemed the father of gynecology, who used Black slave women to experiment in his own backyard without anesthesia. Like the, we have been used for the advancement of this entire country, but specifically for the advancement of medicine and technology against our will for literally hundreds of years. So you're absolutely right in that. Um, once someone uh, has that experience like you had, and I'm so glad that happened for you, uh, you can then, if you're open-minded enough, understand where we come from and where we stand. It's like we've been told so much, so many falsities, right, uh, for the advancement of medicine in this country, right here. We're just good. You have bad blood, so we're going to give you this medication. When really we just want to see how to cure syphilis. That is a traumatic experience, and there's years of trauma in that way that has caused us to show up and be cautious in the way that we do. And so, um, unfortunately. 
only 5% of US physicians are black, right? And so imagine not feeling like you can even connect and have an understanding with your healthcare provider. Of course, your many black people believe, um, and not wrongly, that, hey, you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, you don't come out. And so we don't want to go. Right. We've seen this with COVID-19. Um, Hispanic people and people of color have disproportionately been impacted by COVID-19. Right. And there is a all type of theories as to why that is. But the fact of the matter is um, it, it's no question that we are disproportionately impacted by nearly every single chronic condition and chronic disease and pandemic um, in this country. And we have been used historically, our bodies and our brains have been used to advance medicine. Um, and one of the one of the best resources um, to learn that historical, those that historical data and reference is a book called Medical Apartheid medical apartheid does an absolute phenomenal job of chronicling how people of color have been used in this country for the advancement of medicine and it really helps you to understand um, why we feel the way we feel about medicine and healthcare. Um, and so you're right it's we are more likely to lean a min little more towards maybe a conspiracy theory or not be as trusting of some of the data and information that comes out a lot of times the data is not necessarily wrong in the studies and their results, but they were skewed from the beginning because their entire population sample didn't look like us. There's so much that happens with regard to medicine that causes the outcomes to say one thing about us that we sometimes can't wrap our brain around when we dig into the uh, intricacies of how they attain that data. Right. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking about, I heard a piece on, on NPR a while ago on like the one area in which the black community is doing better than the white community is opioid addiction. Mm. And the reason is that white doctors subconsciously or not don't think that black people's pain is as real as white people's pain. And so mm. we're so they're not being prescribed, you know, these deadly painkillers. It's like, oh great, you know <laughs> once the unconscious bias worked in our favor, go us. So you know <laughs> Um, you're, you're absolutely right. There has been, and, and it was toted in medical journals and things like that many years ago that, you know, black people don't uh, have a higher pain. We have a higher pain tolerance. And for that reason, um, we don't need to be prescribed pain medications or uh, pain mitigation techniques um, as soon as uh, our non-black counterparts. And um, I've actually had people in our farm to table, or excuse me, in our um, Black Health Academy classes, we teach a class every month called Get Planted. We've been doing it over two years now. And I've had people attend that class, it's 100% free community class and say, I had a dentist tell me, you know, oh, I thought you didn't feel pain, right? They've had healthcare providers say this to their face, right? Um, they did a study of medical school students a few years ago that showed the exact same thing. Like, I thought they didn't feel pain. I thought, and so what does that mean? That means when they're being diagnosed with something, we're more likely to be diagnosed at a later stage of something too late, right? When, because our doctors thought, hey, we thought it was just a matter of go lose weight or go get your blood pressure down. Um, and so I've had a person Personally, a doctor tell me he was shocked that I wasn't overweight, that I didn't have high cholesterol, that I didn't have hypertension. He was literally shocked um, by it and wanted to know what was my regimen and what did I do? It was just, it's just appalling um, the experiences that we have. And a lot of people like to say they're imagined or you know we're just constantly pulling the race card, um, but that's not the case. This is our lived experience every single day. Mm. Yeah. So when, when you work um, with, with um, Farm to Table, Mm -hmm. What are the behavioral challenges that you that you work with people to overcome? Yeah. So um, in farm to table, farm is spelled P-H-A-R-M, by the way. And the reason for that is because I, I created something called the farm canvas, the farm canvas. Um, and P-H-A-R-M is an acronym. And that acronym represents the biggest barriers or, as you say, behavior challenges that people face when they're trying to adopt uh, a plant-based diet or just really adopt a healthy living lifestyle. And so farm stands for number one, pills, powders, potions, and procedures. Uh, what people typically 
have experience in their journey to health is using one of those to kind of shortcut their way to health. So whether that's peels like vitamins or weight loss peels, whether that's powders like your vegan protein powders, your green powders, um, whether that's potions like the lemonade diet, the cabbage soup diet, right? Apple cider vinegar, right? Or is that if that's maybe it's a procedure like a gastric bypass or the sleeve, right? And so peels, powders, potions, and procedures are something that we have to unlearn. And because what it has done is a created this, there's got to be a shortcut mindset, right? And so the H in the farm can canvas um, stands for harmful habits. And so this is, we describe in the course as, you know, late after dinner means time for dessert. Or the example I give my students is every time I used to go to the gas station to put gas in my car, I used to think I had to go in and get a snack, right? And so helping them to identify the harmful habits that they do every single day without really thinking about it, um, that has lent to the, the whatever condition they're facing. The A in the farm canvas stands for addictions, right? And so another behavior thing that we have to deal with is addictions to specifically SOS, salt, oil, and sugar. And so maybe addictions has been their barrier to success. The R in the farm canvas stands for rapid weight loss tactics. So um, that's, listen, I can go on this 21 day cleanse and that's gonna help me drop 30 to 40 pounds and I can do it rapidly. Or I'm gonna buy this uh, clothing that's gonna restrict my breathing and wear it when I work out and that's gonna help me lose weight faster, right? So the R is rapid weight loss tactics. And finally, the M in the farm canvas stands for misconceptions and miseducation, right? And this really comes into play with what we were talking about earlier, Howard, just about like, is this way of eating and living accessible uh, to us? And people with misconceptions and miseducation comes things like, can I truly get everything I need on a whole food plant-based diet? Or this way of eating is just too expensive or everything I eat needs to be organic or um, I'm gonna be protein deficient. Um, and so miseducations and misconceptions or I'm gonna get too skinny. I'm gonna lose a lot of weight. I'm gonna look pale, right? Or I'm gonna gain weight because all I'm gonna eat is starch. And so we go through each one of those in the farm canvas throughout the six weeks in the live course and break those down and help people begin to shift their behavior um, and their belief systems around what it really means to adopt a plant-based diet and be healthy. Mm. And so which, which of these uh, does it vary or is there one that's sort of the biggest sticking point or the first one? Uh, the one that I would say it's probably most common for most students, because each student has to identify at least two on the farm canvas that they believe have been barriers, and probably the most popular, hands down, is addictions. Um, addictions to salt, oil, and sugar. Um, a lot of students come into the course with um, sugar addictions, with salt addictions, oil addictions. And so what's interesting about those is that they te technically can all be uh, considered vegan, right? So while salt, oil, and sugar is not necessarily an animal product, a lot of our students, when they enter the course, they're, a lot of them are already somewhere on the spectrum of being plant-based. They're like, oh, I haven't eaten meat in three weeks or three months already, or I've been vegan for 10 years. But what is present is that addiction to salt, oil, and mm -hmm. sugar, and they find out that's been their barrier to really reaching their goal. Mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, in, in any community, those are pretty virtuous addictions compared Absolutely. to... Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's worldwide. Right? Like, it's much better than, you know, alcohol or nicotine or painkillers or, uh, or cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Arguably, I mean, I, I consider sugar a narcotic, quite yeah. honestly. No, I mean, I mean, I mean in terms of uh, like how they're viewed. Oh yes, like, agree. Like you can be a very virtuous person, a very good, responsible person, and still be completely addicted to you know some combination of these. Absolutely, hundred percent. Which, which makes it harder, right? There's not the so, there's not the social pressure. No, that's exactly right. It makes it much harder, much harder, and they're um. Uh, there, like you said, there's no social pressure, so it's accepted. If somebody sees you consuming, nobody's thinking twice about it, not realizing that you're feeding an addiction um, or you're dealing with mental health issues that's causing you to use food as a substance. Yeah. So h how do you help people, uh, you know, work through the addiction to get to the other side? Yeah. Well, we, I use my signature plants curriculum. Plants is also an acronym. Um, and so I use my plants curriculum. I'm a sucker for acronyms. It's, it's kind of sad, really. Uh, but um, to, in these six weeks to help people identify their behaviors, you know, one of the biggest um, things that we do and use is uh, the mental health. So the L in plant stands for lose your mind. And in week two, 
in the course is strictly dedicated to behavior change, neuroplasticity, and how the brain works, how we create habits, how we create patterns. Um, and we literally teach kind of the science behind um, how your brain begins to develop new habits and unlearn things um, and, and how to use your brain, make your brain more um, as a slave versus your master, right? We like to say, in the course that just like money, um, your brain is uh, makes a great slave, but a horrible master, right? And some of us are used and overcome by our th thoughts, our beliefs, and you don't have to believe everything you think. And so teaching people, that's where kind of the behavior change science comes in in week two, um, where we really teach that. And then we actually give them the tools and resources. Sometimes some programs, uh, plant-based programs think, just focus on teaching them how to grocery shop um, and giving them recipes. That's not, you have to focus on what incites them to eat this way in the first place? Um, what, what was their upbringing like? Um, what are their triggers, their environmental triggers? What do they have access to? What is their goals? It's not a matter of just throwing a bunch of resources in front of people and saying, here, now you can be plant-based. You really have to get to the root cause and help them identify um, what's, what's, what's going on with them emotionally and mentally. We call it psychological fitness, sci-fi. Um, and then they can move into a place where they're able to continue what you teach them outside of the course. And that's the biggest piece, right? Not reverting back to those old habits once, once the support system is gone. Right. In my, in my experience, you know, most people are using their addictions to self-medicate. Yep. Right. Like there's some. And so when like the first thing we do, like we, I don't we don't tell people like, OK, let's solve your relationship with your mother or let's solve, you know, ancestral trauma. Let's let's start by, you know, not eating the, the candy bar. And but then we know that once we create that space, that lots of other stuff is going to come up. How do you help people work through the original pain that they were using the addictions to mask? Yeah, um, we teach self-awareness, right? Um, we teach self-awareness um, and we do a detox in week one to help people um, start changing their taste buds because once we can get uh, a lot of that sugar, salt, oil, processed foods, out of their diet for even a set amount of time, a small amount of time, they can start thinking differently and thinking more clearly. And so we teach self-awareness. We teach how to, and we teach emotional intelligence. So we teach how to identify when this emotion comes up. Number one, what triggered it? Um, number two, what thoughts and behaviors followed it? All of our um, students are required to log their food for the entire six weeks. So I'm able to go in on the back end and see everything they ate and drank for those past six weeks. And so when we're going over their food and they then have access to go back and see what they ate, food logging is really powerful because they don't realize how many unconscious food decisions they make. So when they're able to go see wow, this happened, I'm always doing this at this time of the day. And that's usually when I feel the most stressed um, when I'm working, or that's usually when, you know, I just got home and I'm inundated with kids and spouse. And so they're able to see their own patterns. I'm able to see their patterns. And in that detox phase, we're able to take some of those things out of their diet and the, the fog starts to lift. They can think more clearly, they can sleep better. Um, and then we can have an open and honest conversation about what's really plaguing them. Um, and so the emotional intelligence piece is huge, uh, the self-awareness piece is huge and we even have an assignment where we ask them uh, to write down who they are without saying what they do um, and that's really about getting to know them and that's so hard for people how are you would be amazed because most people when you say who are you they want to say you know what they do right well well i'm a teacher i'm a professor of i'm a doctor of i'm a social worker and i say no don't describe your work that changes, describe who you are without saying what you do. And it's a really fun assignment. And so we do things like that um, to help them become more in tune with who they are. And then we have open discussion, which is huge because I teach the course live. It's not um, self-led, it's live within structure every week. And so we have people coming on crying and really understanding and recognizing where this behavior is coming from, um, feeling like they weren't enough, um, realizing it's just a habit they continue um, because that's the way they were raised and they ready, they're ready to break the cycle. So really creating a safe place where people are comfortable with sharing, um, with sharing their experiences, and then they have the support of their classmates and my team. Um, and it really makes a really vulnerable, uh, rich experience. Mm. So, you know, one thing that um, I, I got a little bit sort of 
an emotional charge from what, what you were talking was when you said, you know, the brain, it makes a great slave and a terrible master. So that's clearly incendiary language. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, for, you know, if we talk about that, if like white people talk about that, it's just a metaphor. But when you're talking about that in the black community, that's like a real challenge, isn't it? To say, are you a slave to habits, to habits of thinking, to these companies that make food that's designed to addict you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining you, you, you're not using those terms carelessly. No, no, not at all, right? It's all very, everything is very intentional. Um, and you're right. And it really hits home for people when we, when we frame it in that way. But understanding that we don't realize um, that by, by the age of 35, truly about 90% of what we think, we feel our emotional responses to things are programmed. We don't consciously react in that way. It's programming from the previous 20, 30 years of our experience and mostly of our childhood. And so what we inevitably have to do in the course, because in, in our course, our students are average around 35 to 55. Um, so they're really programmed by the time they show up. Um, is we have to teach them how you've literally been a slave to your mind for this many years. And sometimes when we are so used to living in dysfunction, when we're removed from that dysfunction, we seek it out. We don't even realize we go seek out a way to place ourselves back into that dysfunction so we feel like we're at home. And so teaching mm -hmm. people how to detach from these um, unhealthy uh, thought patterns um, and these dysfunction, dysfunctional way of responding to situations, i.e. I pick up sugar when I feel stressed, um, then that helps them to master their thoughts, their emotions, and their behavior. Um, and then when you become the master, we always say like, you can't control when these thoughts uh, um, show up, but you can certainly control how long they stay. And so getting out of that loop, that, that negative dysfunctional thought loop and thought pattern is really a critical to behavior change. Right. And, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by sort of using the metaphor of slavery because, you know, I, I, you know, I could argue that the, the big food companies are perpetuating mm -hmm. A, you know, a form of slavery and that like we know that the sugar trade is essentially what led to the, the global slave trade, yeah. right? Like to, to, it's, it's almost like, like in order to know our history as a species is to come face to face with outrage over things that are happening now. This wasn't slavery. This wasn't Jim Crow. This isn't redlining. This is, I mean, you know, like look at, you know, Aunt Jemima's gone as a, as a symbol, but high fructose corn syrup marketed to black people is, is going strong. <laughs> yes, unhealthy foods, um, are advertised 40% times higher in communities of color. And that's huge, right? What we see um, essentially plant seeds in our subconscious about what's available to us and what is and isn't good for us. You know, I, we often talk about, we have to, I, I live in Metro Detroit, um, in downtown Detroit actually, and we have to drive out to the suburbs to see stores and things that are dedicated to health and fitness. If I wanna go to a running store, a golf store, a hockey store, that's not gonna be in my backyard, yard, right? So now I need transportation and I have to be informed enough to know it exists, right? But if you drive through a lot of our communities um, and more urban dwellings where people of color live throughout the United States, you're gonna see fast food places, you're gonna see liquor stores, you're gonna see advertisements for junk food. You go into lo locally private owned grocery stores, right? The produce selection is limited at best. Um, and there is way more junk food and processed foods and convenience foods in our local uh, dollar stores and our local communi community stores, our bodegas. And so what we see then is that, okay, this is what's affordable to me. You know, I can pay a dollar for a can of something or a couple cent for a pack of ramen noodles and this is how I can feed my family, right? And so a lot of times uh, people are forced to make the decision on what struggle to exist, to, to, to battle today, right? Do I deal with food today? Do I deal with keeping the lights on today? Do I deal with, and it has a lot to do with accessibility, but you're right, these companies have been so strategic and placing these advertisements in, in the middle of the shows that appeal to us more um, in our own backyards, right? It's all very, very strategic and that's why we have to go to entities like the Black Health Academy to get educated on, no, uh, health is available to you. Being a plant-based vegan, 
right, living in one of these communities is available to you. Um, and there's a better way to do this. And you can, and, and high blood pressure just doesn't run in your family. It's the behaviors that do, and you don't have to be on this medication for the rest of your life. Just having to constantly debunk these things that are implanted by the healthcare system, by advertisements, by television uh, is, is a huge job. Right. So I'm thinking like, you know, what are the obstacles to a, uh, a black owned running store in downtown Detroit? And it's, you know, there's probably market forces, right, in terms of um, investment, in terms of demand right now. And, you know, so you're creating demand with the uh, Black Health Academy. Um, I'm curious, are, are you doing things to increase the black and, and people of color membership in the plant-based nutrition support group? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, one of the <clears throat> things is I've literally uh, introduced my community to PBNSG more, meaning um, I advertise more to uh, the events that we have coming up at PBNSG. Uh, things like this, I always share them with my community, which has brought more people of color online to view them. Now that we're mostly virtual, virtual, I've had people show up to our events. Now, I'll tell you what happens, though. Um, it's a lot of times some of these communities aren't very inviting, Howard. I remember I specifically had a client who uh, went to one of our culinary classes when we were still doing things in person. And she said she showed up and she sat down at the table and one of the women said to her, it was a white woman, um, what are you doing here? Where do you come from, right? Um, and so now we, even, we gotta work on being more inviting. Uh, a lot of times we show up to these events and we just don't feel like we're welcome. Um, and so, um, but what, but uh, I won't stop trying because it's so important um, that we intersperse these messages and that we have access to these uh, resources. And so that's part of the reason that I wrote the open letter about two weeks ago to the entire community about what it means to be Black in America, number one, so that we can start having an open dialogue and realize that um, we need to be more compassionate about people's experiences and we need to do more from an activism standpoint to combat anti-racism or to combat racism, mm -hmm. should I say, um, and com combat injustices. Um, so yes, I've done that. Um, I've also partnered with um, an entity out of Chicago, uh, the, the CEO over, over there who was a black woman, PBNM, Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. Um, and her and I are working on um, a project to bring access to this content using the resources that PBNSG has and PBNM has um, to a more vulnerable community as well. Um, and so- what's, what's her name? Uh, uh, Meryl, M-E-R-Y-L. Her name is Meryl. I, I'll have to get her last name for you. Okay. I should have it here. Um, maybe, maybe you can introduce us. I'd love to interview her. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can talk about it. Um, her and I started working on some projects, so I think it was last year. And then with the COVID and everything, we put things on pause temporarily because I told her I had a project that I was working on that I wanted to bring her in on. Um, but we, we would meet every week, every two weeks and talk about creating an entire program that's focused on people of color. But again, we're going to use the PBNSG and PBNM platform to target it because we're like, hey, here we are, two Black women, you know, executive directors of these huge plant-based organizations and uh, we, we need to do more to make it more inclusive. So absolutely. Great. So uh, we're, we're, we're past the hour. So I'm uh, be mindful of your time. Anything that we didn't talk about that you'd like to bring up or mention? Um, no, I feel good about everything. How are we? We okay. covered a lot today. <laughs> Cool. Oh, one more question for you. Yeah. Um, I've been asking guests this a lot because just because I really enjoy the, the answers. Um, any music that you've been listening to or that you like that most people don't know that, you know, soothes your soul or girds you or makes you happy that, uh, that people can go follow? What an exi exciting, fun question. Yes. So um, my go-to station on Pandora, Howard, is the FKJ sta station. FKJ stands for French Kiwi Juice. It is, <laughs> it is this artist, this French artist, um, and I think his music is amazing. So I love French Kiwi Juice, um, and I listen to that. I also like an artist by the name of Masigo, M-A-S-E-G-O. Um, and those type of vibes really chill me out. And um, so I love walking, running to them, or that's what I would kind of ride and brainstorm and think and problem solve on. That would be my background noise. Awesome. I'll put links <laughs> to them in the show notes. Thank you. 
Wow. So Lisa A. Smith, uh, this was just such a fun, exciting conversation for me. I'm so happy that we got to meet and, um, you know, I'm so impressed with what you're up to and so glad that you are you're doing it in such a way that it spreads and ripples out and, and compounds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard. And thank you so much for uh, giving me the voice. I'm so happy. or so good to be here with you today. All right. Well, t take care. And I uh, hope so someday things will normalize and we'll meet in person. Sounds good. I look forward to it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.